We will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the committee at any time. Uh, good morning to everyone here, and welcome to today's hearing entitled Mentoring, Training, and Apprenticeships for STEM Education and Careers. Uh, before I recognize myself for uh, my opening statement, let me explain to all present that our chairwoman, Barbara um, Comstack is stuck in traffic and I don't think is even across the bridge yet, so we're going to go on and start. We have other individuals uh, caught up in traffic as well. All that is probably compounded by the fact that we're starting an hour earlier than normal because this is a day where a lot of members are leaving town in a few hours. Uh, I still think it's important for us to get started and as soon as uh, Barbara Comstock, the chairwoman, arrives, she'll have an opening statement. As soon as uh, Mr. Lipinski arrives, he'll have a statement as the ranking member. And I'm going to go in and give my opening statement just so we can get started and uh, introduce you all. But at various points, we might be interrupted as individuals arrive and, and have opening statements. Uh, this hearing continues the Science Committee's work on STEM. The STEM Education Act of 2015 updated the definition of STEM to include computer science. And the 2017 American Innovation and Competitiveness Act strengthened external stakeholders' roles in studying STEM priorities. Most recently, the committee and the full House approved several bipartisan bills aimed at boosting students' interest in STEM subjects and opportunities for our military veterans and for women and underrepresented minorities starting in kindergarten. Apprenticeships, mentoring, and on-the-job training are proven ways to meet workforce needs. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about the potential for using these workforce development methods to boost STEM education and careers. According to the National Science Board's most recent Science and Engineering Indicators report, the number of U.S. jobs that require science, technology, engineering, math, and computer skills has grown nearly 34 percent in the past decade. STEM workforce demand is forecast to increase steadily for years to come. Filling our STEM workforce needs from certificate level technical occupations to PhDs is essential for our economic competitiveness. STEM jobs are growing in every sector of our economy, from the shop floors in advanced manufacturing to computer programming for our huge service industry sector to cybersecurity for every public and private computer network. According to a recent report from Brookings, half of all STEM jobs are available to workers without a four-year college degree, and these jobs pay a wage 10 percent higher than jobs with similar educational requirements. Filling the workforce pipeline with qualified STEM workers at every level is crucial for our future economic prosperity. The innovative workforce training programs in which our witnesses are involved can provide new opportunities for STEM education and training and encourage young people to pursue STEM-based careers. Successful workforce development programs extend beyond the four walls of classrooms and laboratories. Partnerships between industry and academia can create new ways for young people to pursue STEM careers and boost formal education and training with on-the-job work experiences. Uh, that concludes my opening statements, and I'm going to check to see uh, what we want to do on the if, minority side. Do you want to just wait for Lipinski? Or do you Mr. Mr. Chairman, if we could please wait for Mr. Lipinski okay. to deliver the opening statement when he arrives. Okay. Uh, Thank you. We'll yep. wait for the gentleman from Illinois to arrive, but I'd like to go on and introduce our witnesses so we'll be ready to start. Our first witness today is Dr. Victor McCrary, Vice President of Research and Economic Development and Professor of Chemistry at Morgan State University. In this role, Dr. McCrary and his team focus on developing <coughs> excuse me, a university-wide research ecosystem, increasing external support for the faculty research, and championing, championing an entrepreneurial culture among faculty and students. Dr. McCrary is also a member of the National Science Board and chair of the task force on the skilled technical workforce. With the NSB, Dr. McCrary recently proposed the Blue Collar STEM Initiative to explore the technical skills required by the nation's workforce, which do not necessitate pursuing a traditional four-year college degree. Dr. McCrary earned a Bachelor of Arts in Chemistry from the Catholic University of America and a Master's of Science in Executive Master's of Engineering from the University of Pennsylvania. He also earned a PhD in Physical Chemistry from Howard University. 
Let's see, Dr. Sands is our second witness, uh, and he is the Department Chair of Computer Integrated Technologies at Moraine Valley Community College. Dr. Sands also serves as the Director and Principal Investigator for the Center for System Security and Information Assurance, where he and his team study the technology workforce needs, both nationally and in the local Chicago metropolitan region, in ranking member Lipinski's district. Dr. Sands earned a Bachelor of Arts in Communications from Chicago State University and a Master of Arts in Human Performance and Testing from Governor State University. He also earned his PhD in Education from Colorado State University. Our third witness today is Mr. Montez King, Executive Director of the National Institute of Metalworking Skills, developing national standards and competency-based credentials in manufacturing trades. In this role, Mr. King is responsible for overseeing the administration, programs, and strategic plan of the organization. Prior to joining NIMS, Mr. King served as training and technology manager for Magna International, one of the world's largest OEM automotive parts manufacturers. In October 2017, he was appointed to the President's Task Force on Apprenticeship Expansion. Mr. King began his career at Teledyne Energy Systems as a machinist apprentice and spent over 25 years advancing into management positions. He holds a Maryland State Machinist Journeyman Certificate, a Bachelor's of Science in Information Technology, and a Master's of Education degree in Adult Education from the University of Phoenix. Our final witness today is Dr. John Bardo, President of Wichita State University. Wichita State's innovation campus and applied learning initiatives have drawn positive national attention because of the partnerships forged with local and international companies, including Airbus, Dassault Systems, and Koch Industries. The university has a long history of working with industry through its National Institute of Aviation Research and National Center for Aviation Training. Dr. Bardo's academic interests involve the relationships between higher education, the economy, and quality of life. He received a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Cincinnati and a master's degree in sociology from Ohio University. He also earned a PhD in sociology from Ohio State University and attended the Institute for Educational Management at Harvard. And we welcome you all, appreciate your expertise, and as I mentioned when I introduced myself to you all a few minutes ago, it's nice to have a hearing on such an interesting subject that's a very positive subject, that's a bipartisan subject, and that's important to the future of America. Um, I'm going to hold off for a second um, and uh, get a read for how far away uh, uh, Chairwoman Comstock is before we proceed. Mr. Lipinski is in Rayburn, so he's okay. almost here. We're getting close. <laughs> <laughs> is what? In the, in the garage. garage. In the garage, okay. Um, in that case, where's my... Um, if you want to talk to the witness and try... Or the witness. No, I'm going to wait. Yeah, we can wait spots for a few minutes okay. um, until Mr. Lipinski gets here. Okay. It sounds like he might have been here first. Okay. Uh, since we're already off to a pretty good start, I think we're just going to recess for about five minutes and wait for the uh, chairwoman and the ranking member to arrive. Uh, they'll each have an opening statement, and then we'll uh, go straight to your testimony. So uh, we stand in recess for about five minutes. I think it just...
Good morning, and my apologies. There was an accident on GW Parkway. <laughs> so one of the, I've benefited being close by, but sometimes also <laughs> some of the disadvantages. So this morning's hearing will explore how participation in mentoring, training, and apprenticeship opportunities impact STEM students and may assist in addressing the growing need for a diverse and technically trained STEM workforce. The purpose of this hearing is to identify what STEM workforce development programs should be further examined and what statistics are needed to increase our understanding of these tools, the context in which they are most effective, and the barriers to their application and expansion. About 20% of all jobs in the U.S. economy require some level of STEM training, and that will grow. Those occupations are projected to grow about 9% over the next decade, faster than any other employment category. In order to meet this demand, Congress needs to make informed decisions on what are the most impactful and innovative tools to address the STEM skills gap and build up America's skilled technical workforce. A majority of these technical STEM jobs do not require a bachelor's degree. In many cases, these good positions, such as computer programmers, information technology support, and nurses, require two-year degrees, occupational licenses, or certifications. Technical STEM jobs are often among the best paying and most stable jobs available to individuals with sub-baccalaureate education. By supporting innovative workforce development programs for STEM careers, like those our witnesses are part of, we not only increase the students' economic opportunities and security, but also our nation's. To ensure the United States' competitiveness in the global economy, we must leverage this hard work and ingenuity of women and men of all ages, education levels, and backgrounds to grow America's technical workforce. I look forward to building on the progress this committee has already made through the Inspire Women Act, which was signed into law by the President last year, and the recently House-passed Building Blocks of STEM to encourage and grow the number of young women and underrepresented minorities in STEM fields also. Reaching these groups at a young age and motivating them to stay in the STEM fields is extremely important, but we must also ensure we support programs aimed at keeping women and underrepresented minorities in the STEM pipeline and advancing in STEM careers. There are recognized models from across the country and the world that demonstrate how apprenticeships, mentoring, and on-the-job training are tools used by many different industries to address skills gaps. One thing is clear, the most successful programs are an integration of academia, technical training, and hands-on work experience. I know as I go throughout my district and I uh, meet with employers who, who need employees, they really want to be able to you know, bring them in and train them you know, to their uh, workplace. And so I think what we're talking about here today really fits that, that needs gap. So I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about the programs they lead and how they are working with industry to meet the diverse and growing needs for a STEM-capable workforce. Thank you. And I now uh, recognize the ranking member, Mr. Lipinski, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Comstock. I don't know if you know, but I was racing you to get in. You uh, passed me on GW Parkway, and I saw you again on, on the 14th Street Bridge, um, but somehow you made it in here before me. So. Uh, I, I apologize for, for being late. We were both uh, stuck in the same traffic jam on the, uh, on the parkway. Uh, so I want to thank uh, and thank Chairman uh, Smith for uh, holding forth here and uh, Ms. Bonamici also. Uh, the uh, National Science Board recently released its uh, Biennial Science and Engineering Indicators Report. Uh, my biggest takeaway from the report is that we're falling behind. China has learned from our economic success, which we have achieved in large part through investments in science and innovation. China and others are aggressively investing in research and development and in their own STEM workforces. Meanwhile, we're tapping the brakes. This is not the time to be complacent about our standing as a global economic leader. Other countries are nipping at our heels and we must take meaningful action before it is too late. While creating financial incentives and lowering costs for businesses may help provide a boost, fiscal policy alone will not keep our economy strong. To ensure our long-term economic health, we must continue to actively invest federal dollars in the long-term foundation on which our economy is built, research and development, and human capital. In today's increasingly technological and data-driven economy, a strong STEM workforce is critical for growth and global competitiveness. 
When workers are equipped with the technical skills that industry needs, companies are able to innovate, increase production, expand, and create new jobs. This virtuous cycle is interrupted when employers cannot find workers with the skills they need. This is where we find ourselves today. The so-called STEM skills gap is not new. While we can debate the precise cause and scope of the gap, its effects are undeniable. The demand for STEM skills is growing and rapidly evolving as employers continually update their business models to stay ahead of the competition. And our education system has generally been slow to respond and adapt to the changing economy. As a result, businesses have struggled to find qualified workers. The skills gap is worse in some industry sectors than others, but in many cases, it is dragging down productivity. There are good examples of innovative approaches to career-focused STEM education around the country, such as the NSF-funded Advanced Technological Education Program at Moraine Valley Community College in my district, run by one of today's witnesses, Dr. Sands. I'm also encouraged by companies such as Accenture, Aon, and IBM. They're piloting an old model of workforce development, the apprenticeship, in new fields like cybersecurity and customer service. But we'll need far more innovative programs like these to meet growing demand. The issue of STEM workforce development is a particularly important one to me. Chicago is unique among major U.S. cities in the degree to which its economy is strong in both service and manufacturing jobs. These sectors are increasingly driven by technology, automation, and data analytics, so the demand for STEM skills is high. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today their thoughts on mentoring, apprenticeships, and other innovative strategies for workforce development, and whether they should be more widely adopted in new industry sectors in geographic regions. As ranking member of this committee, subcommittee, I'm particularly interested in hearing ideas on the role federal science agencies can play in increasing coordination between industry and educational institutions. We need to close the STEM skills gap in the near term, but I think it is just as important to create an agile STEM workforce that can respond to changing needs over the long term. Our future depends on it. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, and I now recognize Dr. McCrary for five minutes to present his testimony. Thank you, Chairwoman Comstock and Ranking Member Lipinski. On behalf of my colleagues on the National Science Board, I'm grateful for this opportunity. The number of U.S. jobs requiring substantial STEM expertise has grown nearly 34 percent over the past decade. As of 2015, nearly one in seven workers with at least a four-year degree say their job requires a bachelor's level of STEM expertise. However, more than 16 million more jobs do not require a bachelor's degree, yet require significant experience in at least one and expertise in one technical field. Moreover, these jobs are growing in number. At the same time, other countries are challenging our leadership in science and technology. Between 2000 and 2014, the number of Americans with four-year STEM degrees rose 53%. In China, this number was 360%. Just last week, the National Science Board released a statement predicting that China would surpass the United States in R&D investment this year. China is targeting up to 15% of their GDP at talent development and China is not the only country that is chasing us. If we want to remain a world leader, we must leverage the hard work, creativity, and ingenuity of women and men of all ages, educational levels, and backgrounds. We need scientists searching for cures for genetic disorders, engineers securing our electrical grid, skilled technicians in our hospitals and labs, and farmers growing more with fewer resources. We can't do this by relying on a relatively small and distinct STEM workforce. Instead, government, business leaders and educators must work together to build a STEM-capable U.S. workforce. That workforce goes beyond traditional scientists and engineers to include the often overlooked skilled technical workers who help form the backbone of our economy. Skilled technical jobs are well-paying and are found across the United States. Businesses large and small need adaptable, STEM-capable workers at every educational level and from all demographic groups in order to compete. But according to a survey conducted by the GAO, Employers in 80% of local areas said they had trouble filling jobs in skilled technical occupations. Because we both see a need and an opportunity, the board has created in November of 2017 a task force on the skilled technical workforce. I've submitted the task force charge along with my written testimony. 
We are exploring ways the NSB and NSF can help strengthen this segment of the workforce, including by identifying gaps in information and data, exploring ways to build and leverage partnerships, and examining evidence-informed approaches to removing the barriers that far too many students and workers encounter. Although it is still early in the work of the board's task force, I will use the remainder of my time to highlight several points that have already become clear to us. What we have here is a failure to communicate, or more specifically, to coordinate between businesses desperate for STEM-capable skilled U.S. workers and students and incumbent workers seeking well-paying, stable jobs. Too often, the students we produce or the training we provide to workers doesn't seem to align with what industry wants. At the same time, industry hiring practices can themselves be a barrier. For example, requiring a four-year degree for openings where a certification or two-year degree might be a better fit. During a recent listening session at Baton Rouge Community College in Louisiana, board members sat at a table in which industry participants lamented their inability to find workers with specific skills and a community college student sitting right there at the table saying, hey, that's me. We also see that there's a stigma associated with community colleges, technical schools, and vocational training in the minds of students, parents, employers, and yes, academics. We need to change that perception and fix our own blind spots and baggage. To recognize how critical these workers are to the success of our nation's science and engineering enterprise. To give you an example, last year the NSVB visited LIGO in Louisiana. We heard of the LIGO scientist who won the Nobel Prize in physics for the discovery of gravitational waves. But what you not, might not know about LIGO is that it's an industrial facility, miles of carefully welded high vacuum pipeline and banks for air filters as tall as a house. It's skilled technical workers, HVAC experts, electricians, and other workers without a four-year degree who built that, keep it running, and they are fundamental to the scientific discoveries that are made. This is blue-collar STEM. Next, we must better leverage our public investments. At NSF, programs like INCLUDES and Advanced Technological Education, or ATE, do this by facilitating partnerships between educational institutions and local businesses, or between research-intensive universities like the University of Tennessee and local community colleges. We learn what works so others can take these practices to scale. We have all have the role to play in this. Technical schools, community colleges, trade and labor organizations, chambers of commerce, industry, four years colleges, research universities, and HBCUs like Morgan State University and other minority serving institutions needed to create on ramps into STEM for all segments of our population. We cannot com compete without their inclusion and wholehearted participation. I'm glad you're having this hearing and I'm looking forward to hear it, learning from the rest of the witnesses. Madam Chair, this concludes my testimony. Thank you, and I now recognize Dr. Sands, and I understand you have a video, so look forward to that. Yes, good morning, um, Chairwoman Comstock and Ranking uh, Member Lipinski. I'd like to start with a short video that talks a little bit about our programs and uh, highlights one of our students. The stakes are high at this cyber defense competition. Top-notch security pros are posing as the bad guys, trying to break into simulated business computer networks, the kinds you'll find on Wall Street, in banks, or hospitals. And teams of students are having to think like hackers, competing against each other to keep the attackers out. This is great practice for what they're learning in class. In many ways, cybersecurity provides a great career path. There's thousands of different types of jobs out there. So do we have a motherboard on a router? It almost looks like a PC, doesn't it? With support from the National Science Foundation, the Center for System Security and Information Assurance at Moraine Valley Community College outside Chicago has become a national center for cybersecurity education. Center Director Eric Spengler says the school teaches students the ins and outs of keeping computer networks buttoned up tight. Students come from all walks of life. I'm an electrician, um, but I've been forced to retool my career. I decided to come back to upgrade my skills. I was in printing for 13 years and that industry is kind of dying. This is a real functioning network. What makes it a national center is its virtualization data center, an online practice field of sorts made up of simulated computers and networks that act like the real thing. I'm actually on this machine up here and uh, going through the firewall I am scanning uh, this machine down here. Students and faculty from other institutions log on for training 
from virtually anywhere. Today, students are using it to practice for the next cyber defense competition. Industries are partnering with Moraine Valley. In a lot of cases, actually, students are hired before they finish the programs. One partner, Dell Secure Works, hired graduate Carlos Marquez. Oh, I love it. Yeah, it's, it's a great team. It's uh, good people, good culture. Spangler is proud to point to Carlos as an example for others. He has a good job, his dream car, and at his next cybersecurity competition, he won't be a student playing defense. He'll be one of the cybersecurity pros. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien. I'm here today to share my knowledge and opinion on how apprenticeship programs can address the growing gap in the country's technical workforce. I'd like to present a few potential approaches to increase the quality uh, and participation rate of apprenticeship programs in technological areas like cybersecurity. Over my career, one of the areas of the workforce development I've been most involved in is the study and implementation of effective programs to increase student awareness of critical technology fields. Both as a professor and principal investigator, I have led teams to develop new and innovative career awareness programs. These programs present students with self-directed opportunities to explore interesting technical jobs. The exploration also requires students to examine the typical roles and responsibilities associated with each position. These programs also enable students to review salaries, job credentials, and potential career pathways. Another area is expanding partnerships in apprenticeship programs. Moraine Valley Community College has been successful in building partnerships in which local businesses benefit from a continuous pool of qualified applicants. Students benefit by gaining experience and learn workforce skills that are difficult to replicate in the classroom. One example of a successful program would be the partnership between Moraine Valley Community College and ESPO Systems. In the fall of 2017, ESPO Systems was nominated for the Illinois Community College Trustee Association Business and Industry Partnership Award. Representatives from both ESPO Systems and Moraine Valley focus on building apprenticeship programs that provide students with a meaningful and relevant workforce experience. This program also serves dozens of students, most of which go on to full-time employment. ESPO Systems and Moraine Valley staff meet each semester to plan, review, and evaluate the program. One of the other areas I think is important is establishing apprenticeship program standards. As a rash of data breaches continue to make headlines, businesses have gained greater interest in working with academia and federal agencies in adopting national standards. The NSA slash DHS Centers for Academic Excellence program is a good example. This program establishes curriculum requirements, student learning assessment, and a series of institutional requirements. This program serves as a great mechanism to expand apprenticeship programs for the cybersecurity industry. Another area is establishing national credentials earned by completing an apprenticeship program. I believe there is strong support for establishing a national credential that would be directly linked to students' successful completion of a recognized apprenticeship program. The cybersecurity industry is well organized to adopt this type of program that could be directly associated with one of the two national programs that are operated by federal agencies. And those two programs would be um, the Cyber Corps Scholarship for Service program, which is funded through the National Science Foundation. And the other would be the Centers for Academic Excellence and Cyber Defense, which is funded by the uh, National Security Agency and Department of Homeland Security. I also want to stress the importance of community colleges. I would like to highlight the unique role community colleges can contribute to establishing a better national network of apprenticeship programs. Community colleges, as the name indicate, belong to and serve their communities. Students attending community college programs are looking for inexpensive and efficient pathways to new careers and academic opportunities. Community colleges provide their communities with their nurses, healthcare workers, heating and air conditioning technicians, automotive technicians, information technology specialists, cybersecurity specialists, just to name a few. Community colleges have a close relationship with the current technology programs at their local high schools and can, can provide students with an early awareness of career opportunities in technical fields. Any expansion of apprenticeship opportunities should leverage community colleges in their unique position within communities across the nation. That concludes my testimony. Thank you. Thank you, and I now recognize Mr. King for his testimony.
Thank you, Chairwoman Comstock and fellow members for inviting me to speak out about innovative work uh, training programs. I, I want to start out with some statistics. I don't want to create an echo chamber because of my uh, panelists here, uh, but I need to say that the stakes are high. And I would like to start with about three and a half million jobs are likely to be needed within the next uh, decade. And with the skills gap, uh, there's likely to be about two million, <clears throat> 2 million of those jobs unfilled. And another really interesting statistic is only 16% of all American high school seniors are either proficient in mathematics or are interested in STEM careers. That's significant. So when we talk about building training programs, you can have the best program in the world, but if you don't have any bodies in there, it doesn't matter. So you have to increase the interest. So how do we do that? Now I'm gonna to move to my next slide. This leads into my next slide. And just bear with me, because everyone has their own way of recruiting, and I recruit people all the time. Uh, I'm always looking for someone to enter into the skilled workforce. So the walking dead syndrome is, is the truth and reality. It is, um, now think about, this is a popular series that's on TV. And the series framework is based on an overwhelmingly large population of zombies searching for a small majority of flesh for the survivors. It's just a small amount of survivors. And you have all of these zombies, millions, millions, with maybe a thousand survivors. And they're all looking for the same thing. And this is a striking parallel to our college campuses. It, it extremely is, it really is. Now think about all of those individuals on the college campuses going for jobs. They're, 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 trying, they're planning for jobs that either won't exist when they come out of school or rapidly evolving, or it's not within that skilled frame where most of the jobs were, well, we've heard statistics where you show that most of the jobs will be for, won't require a four-year degree, but most of our students or our, our kids are going for four-year degrees. So it's extremely important to speak the reality and truth to our young people so that they know the truth, and it really works when we talk to these young people about the walking dead syndrome. So how do we train? And you got, we got to look at today's economy where the jobs are more integrated, cross-discipline, technology-driven. So when we build these STEM education training programs, I believe we need to focus on the work and learn opportunities, more work and learn opportunities. We also need to focus on uh, creating a career education pathway that supports students from middle school through their career advancement. And this leads into my next slide. So when you look at this slide, it, you, you see a work and learn career pathway model where we have our gateway, how do we get in, and then we have our goal. And then you can see credentials as we get to our goal. It's the industry recognized credentials. Now if you look at the vertical path, you see that's, that's a straight upward path, training, education, go to college. Right? Everyone you talk to, get, go to college. And then you have on the horizontal, hands-on experience. You have those individuals that Maybe come out of high school and just go with hands-on experience. But what we're seeing is neither path is necessarily the, the bad, best path. We need to go on a diagonal path where you're getting education and hands-on experience contemporaneously interwoven together, together. So this is what we're seeing as a successful model. Maybe not for everyone, but it can help with those, that large pool of opportunities that exist and that are not being filled. So I'll go into uh, my last point, which is industry engagement. Industry has to identify what the standards are. It's not the schools, it's not uh, the education community. We're, we are to follow what industry says is needed. And so how do we do that? So when we look at industry recognized credentials, industry recognized standards. That is the key. The standards are the foundation that are actually written by industry. Industry, they're writing down what their needs are and then developing credentials around those standards to measure individuals against the standard. So if we use the credentials as an adhesive or a connector throughout the careers, for example, for me, 
I, I got started in middle school. Someone gave me the walking dead syndrome, maybe in different words, but they gave me that syndrome. Uh, they talked to me about it. And as I moved through my career, I earned the credentials and I had the work experience, making me a straight A student through the entire process. So I want to thank you again for having me. And I, I look forward to some of the uh, questions coming through. That captures everyone's imagination. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Bardo, follow up that act, right? <laughs> yeah, well, thank, thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Thank you for uh, everybody for having, having me here today. And the, t the timing couldn't have been better in terms of the following uh, uh, Mr. King. Uh, for those of you that don't spend all day thinking about Wichita, which I can't imagine any of you sitting up there uh, wouldn't be doing that, uh, Wichita is the third highest percentage, it has the third highest percentage of engineers in the workforce uh, compared to uh, San Jose and uh, Houston. And we are very uh, dependent on technology-based exports. Uh, in fact, to set up our programs, when I came back home to Wichita, I did a study of the structure of the Wichita economy. We're very tightly tied to Dallas-Fort Worth and we're very tightly tied to the I-35 corridor. We also export uh, to five or six places in the United States. Uh, export goods are where you make your money, and then we export overseas. Um, we knew that those were very important things to, to know about the, about the economy, but how does that play out with an individual industry? So we at the university started a blueprint, blue, uh, blueprint for regional economic growth which was an analysis with business of their needs. Uh, we didn't go in and tell them what they needed, we asked them. And we identified eight areas where the economy of Greater Wichita could grow. And our goal as a university is to support each of those areas over time as funds become available. Uh, you may also not know that Wichita, has, Wichita State has a very long tradition of working with business and industry. We obtained our first major gift of the year I was born in 1948, uh, which was a wind tunnel given by Beach. Uh, we are now second in the United States in the percent of research money funded by industry. So we're very serious about our relationships with industry. And one of the uh, points I wanna make with you today is that that tie between industry research and education is absolutely crucial if you're going to be able to really make a difference uh, for the capacity of the United States to build STEM uh, and to build STEM-based industries. Uh, we also, as a university, are very prone to experiment. We've been prone to experiment over the course of decades. This isn't new. Uh, and we're very excited about the fact that we have a modified apprenticeship program going at a four-year university. Uh, Wichita State is a, what is uh, in the vernacular known as a research two, uh, which means that we are uh, not the highest level of research, but we're second. Uh, and we have a modified apprenticeship program. Uh, we started it, beta tested it with an aircraft industry. Uh, they were going to outsource a large engineering project to India. We convinced them to allow our undergraduate students to do it. Um, it came in on time, better engineered, and while they weren't hiring, they hired 35% of the students who worked on the project, and 83% of the students stayed in the labor shed. A few others left, Two went to, one went to med school, and one went to get a PhD in engineering, and we're okay with, with both of those outcomes. Uh, we also are in the process of amalgamating a technical college into the university. Wichita Area Technical College, July 1, will become Wichita Tech, WSU Tech. Why are we doing that? There are so many people who have hands-on skills, who want to learn, who want to be part of the economy, want to be part of STEM, but they don't want to take on a 15-week course. They don't want to take on a 120-hour degree. And so what we're trying to do is to find ways of moving those students into the workforce, in the model you were using, moving them into the workforce, and building their capacity through offering short courses, through offering uh, degrees, through uh, offering uh, certificates, 
and building their capacity over time so that they can lead in their field. If they want to be a welder, if they want to be a sheet metal worker, we want them to do that. If they want to be a super sheet metal worker supervisor, we want them to do that. If they want to be a designer of new aircraft, we want them to do that. So, um, Madam Chair, to uh, cut this short, it's time for Congress to act as it did in the 80s. Uh, the Bayh-Dole Act changed the future of higher education in the United States. Uh, I believe it's time for Bayh-Dole too, and I believe this committee is the committee that can make that happen. Thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you very much. I really appreciate all this testimony has given us so much uh, food for thought as well as <laughs> great visualizations too. So uh, thank you. Um, you know, as I was watching the video <clears throat> and as I go around and um, you know, talk to businesses as well as our schools, we know it's always a challenge to get more young women involved and engaged and stay in as, as well as you know, underserved populations and minorities. So I think a lot of what you've talked about here really addresses some of that too. So how, how can we um, how, you know, really maybe get them like from, from kindergarten? Um, I know in my district we have a uh, children's science museum that is uh, stood up and now is going to expand. And that's where my three-year-old granddaughter loves to spend like every waking moment. And I've been in kindergarten classes now where they're coding. And you know, you say so you see the little so there's no daylight. Everybody's in there. And, and what some some of our schools that have like the highest um, uh, so, so very high need schools, high you know, school lunch uh, program have have some of the best science programs in it now. So how do we get that pipeline way down there so that there's, there's never, you know, they're always in it. Sure, I'll start with you, Mr. King, sure. And, and, and that's, that's focusing more on the interest, right, to keep them? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a big stickler on, on putting together uh, achievements, as you know, Dr. Bardo had mentioned, having those achievements all the way through from, from that young age, um, going through their career. And I, and I want to put a personal, just a personal question, uh, um, attribute here, is that I was, someone showed me how to chase a thread. I needed a bolt for my, <laughs> for my bicycle. And it stuck in my head. And that was it. I was done. The rest of my career, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a part. I changed everything about my perception of college and how it would go through. And I think those types of experiences and moments is what we need to share with, with, with the kids so that they can do an interest inventory at that early age. And, and with that interest inventory, it leads you out to your career. And it's a true career, not something that's being pressured by what others say, it's about, about what you actually enjoy doing. So it's with those young children, instead of maybe daddy comes in and does something for the little girl, that they actually walk them through it yeah, and yeah. say, you can do it too. Absolutely, <laughs> Annie. But, but then you have those underserved communities where they don't have that father yeah. or they don't have that mother to show them. And that's where mentoring becomes a, a, an important piece. And so that's why I've dedicated over 10 years of my life mentoring individuals that have that gap. Uh, so that they can get the same experience. It's just not through their biological. Right. And Dr. Barda? If I might, please. Um, one of the things that we know is that we lose a lot of girls in middle school. Mm -hmm. And so really encouraging uh, college women to spend time with girls in middle school uh, is a big deal uh, because it gives them a role model. It shows them you can be a, a normal girl and major in a STEM area. Uh, if you look, um, many of the new areas, particularly in engineering, are becoming more female-centered. Uh, bioengineering, we're seeing a lot more women interested in. Uh, and part of the sales there is you can make a difference in people's lives. And so it becomes, you know, yes, it's math, yes, it's engineering, but at the end of the day, I can make a difference in people's lives. The other thing that we're experimenting with are half credit hour badges. We know that um, a mother of three who's trying to hold down two jobs isn't likely to be able to make a 15 week course. So what we've done is break down many of our areas into uh, 
half credits that take about a week and a half to do. And you can probably figure out how to get a babysitter, how to make things work. And that allows you to inch in. So we're pretty excited about that. Oh, that is great. And then also um, with, you know, I, <clears throat> I have a young woman's leadership program. And one of the things we try and do with the young people is get them into a workplace setting. Like I know, you know, my mom was a teacher. My dad was, was an engineer, but he was sales. So I never was in those type of job settings. Like, you know, I wasn't in a hospital. I wasn't in a, you know, uh, a manufacturing plant. A lot of these places where you just don't understand what goes on there. So I think what, what I love about the mentoring programs and doing this is you're really getting kids in there to and, and, and making sure we can get them to get some experience and see themselves in a workplace and see the whole path around them and the kind of environment they would be in. And I would think, particularly with an underserved population that might not have that experience where mom or dad is taking them to a workplace that you know is, is like this, um, you know, th this really seems like a, a great way that we can get everybody you know, on a level playing field where we get them engaged. And it's sort of not quite as a good question, but well, Dr. Um, McCrary, you haven't. <laughs> yes, Chairwoman Comstock. Um, so one other way that we've been able to successfully do that is engage the technical professional societies who have engaged with students at a very early age. So, for example, uh, we worked in a program a few years ago with the American Chemical Society, mm -hmm. the National Organization of Professional Advancement of Black Chemists and Chemical Engineers, and parents very early on. What happens when your young daughter says, I'm interested in becoming a chemist or becoming a chemical engineer? And so get those societies working very early, um, particularly the minority technical societies like Society of Hispanic Engineers, SOCNIS, Society of Women Engineers. Many of these national organizations have chapters throughout the country that are working at the K through 12 level and at the same time offering workspace opportunities, as you mentioned, bringing people in chemical plants and engineering places and exposing them to them, students to them. So those type of programs are, are strongly encouraged. Great. Okay. And I will uh, now recognize Ms. Bonamici for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Comstock and Ranking Member Lipinski, and thank you to all of our witnesses. First, I want to express concern about President Trump's proposed budget plan. He's calling for a large cut to the Job Corps program, and as well as completely eliminating funding for WANTO, the Women in Apprenticeship and Non-Traditional Occupations. We have in Oregon, Oregon tradeswomen, uh, and they receive funding through WANTO. They've been recruiting, preparing, placing, and retaining women in the building trades uh, very successfully. We need to be investing more, not less, in programs that prepare uh, people to go to work. Uh, and I frequently hear from employers out in Oregon about the challenges they face in uh, recruiting skilled workers. Uh, and unfortunately, small and medium-sized businesses often don't have the resources to establish work-based learning programs. So I have introduced bipartisan legislation with my colleague also on the Education and Workforce Committee, uh, Congressman Drew Ferguson from Georgia, the Bipartisan Partners Act, which would support partnerships to help small and medium-sized businesses establish work-based learning programs and support services for workers using existing funds so it's no additional cost to taxpayers. Mr. King, I understand that the National Institute of Metalworking Skills helps manufacturing businesses of, of all sizes establish and implement apprenticeship programs, but can you uh, identify some of the challenges that small and medium-sized uh, businesses face creating those uh, job training programs and how Congress could help level the playing field? And I do want to save time for another question as well. Uh, when it comes to the smaller organizations, even in bigger organizations dealing with the unions, uh, for manufacturing sector jobs, uh, the registered uh, apprenticeship program has, has proven to be um, a little cumbersome and, and not as attractive for many of the employers. You can go into the construction uh, industry and, it, and it's working well for them, but when you're think, thinking about manufacturing, uh, it does pose uh, some problems. Um, and the, the, the ROI, return on investment, it, it, it doesn't seem attractive to employers. So as a member of the task force, we are working uh, towards 
uh, recognizing apprenticeship programs because there's many programs out there that we call pseudo programs. I mean, they're training. Most companies are training. It's just not either registered or it's not recognized. And with a few quality checks to make sure that it includes some of the key components, I think we can expand and uh, expand more work and learn opportunities. And we can, you know, of course, uh, also. Um, uh, spark more interest in kids. Terrific, and I encourage my colleagues on this committee to uh, look at the Partners Act that uh, Congressman Ferguson and I have. I, I want to shift um, a little bit to big picture, and I know the chairwoman and ranking member know that uh, I'm on the Education and Workforce Committee, as I mentioned, and have over the years um, looked for ways to make sure that students who are going through school uh, who, are, who may be interested in STEM uh, are educated to be more creative and innovative because I keep hearing about the innovative economy. So I started the STEAM caucus and uh, about integrating the arts and design into STEM learning. And there are nationally recognized STEAM schools across the country that are very successful in engaging more students in STEM learning. Uh, CTE, career and technical education, as well in, in uh, K, the K-12 system, the more well-rounded education uh, that is uh, uh, part of the Every Student Succeeds Act, which this uh, the, the last Congress passed with strong bipartisan support, is also going to help engage students early on. Uh, but what I wanted to mention is that uh, not too long ago, Google decided to test its sort of hiring hypothesis, and they crunched all the numbers hiring, firing, promotion data since its inception. Here's what they found. Of the eight most important qualities of their top employees, STEM expertise came in last. The seven top characteristics were all soft skills, being a good coach, communicating, listening well, possessing insights into others, including others of different values and points of view, having empathy toward and being supportive of one's colleagues, being a good critical thinker and problem solver, and being able to make connections across complex ideas. So I know that we're talking about blue collar STEM jobs here today, however, uh, for people who want to advance in careers and for people who want to be uh, successful and stay at companies, what are apprenticeship and work-based skills training doing to include all of these really critical interpersonal skills uh, in, in their curriculum? I'll start with Mr. King and then anyone else who wants to, to weigh in. Uh, sure. With, with the, the work and learn apprenticeship models, uh, it, it gives you those soft skills by, uh, I can tell you, for example, for me, coming into the, my on a work study program, uh, the work day started at 7, and I got there at like 6.50, and it was about seven, five minutes after 7 when it was time to work. I was a good kid, but I just didn't have the soft skills. But the work study program and working around those professionals is what helped me develop uh, the soft skills I needed prior to even, I mean, you could have taught me all you wanted in the classroom. It was in that workplace is where it, it actually happened for me. Does anybody else want to add the, the importance of the soft skills? Yeah, I'll, I'll add a little, a little bit to it. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we work with several companies in, their, in the design of their apprenticeship programs. And part of what we try to do is um, ensure that the types of tasks and jobs that students are involved with will help build those types of skills. Um, and we've worked with, you know, there, there's programs out there, I don't know if you've heard of Necessary Skills now through the Center of Occupation Research and Development, but they focus on six areas. And part of what I think needs to be done is those types of things like communications and ethics and so on need to be built into the experience of an apprenticeship program. It's not just the technical aspects, but it's also, like you said, the, the workforce skills. Thank you. Oh, oh, Dr. McCurry? I just wanted to give you an example. Um, Morgan State University uh, is a member of a, has a Center of Academic Excellence in Cybersecurity, as one of our colleagues mentioned earlier. And when we met with them last fall, um, not only did they want to meet with our Dean of uh, Engineering and our Dean of Computer Science, which is natural, but also our College of Liberal Arts and our School of Business. Why is that important? Because cybersecurity is not just confined to electrical engineering and computer science. It involves psychology, it involves foreign languages, and so they wanted to have that approach in terms of their research. And so for students in those areas, they also want to attract those students as well as those in the hardcore STEM areas. Absolutely. Thank you very much, and I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and I now recognize Mr. Marshall for five minutes. Yeah, thank you, Chairwoman. Um, Dr. Bardo, when I think of Wichita State University, I think of the innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship, capital of the world. And you guys have always been way out there. You've always been a great visionary. Can you just take a minute and share a little bit about your innovation campus and, and what that looks like just so the other members could hear it? 
Sure. What we're attempting to do at Wichita State is actually create an innovation university. <laughs> Excuse me. And when you do that, you have to start with something that people can recognize. So we started by taking an old golf course and turning it into a public-private partnership enterprise uh, where students can work. Uh, they can take three and four years of work in real businesses working on real projects. Uh, at the same time, they're studying uh, general education, studying liberal arts, studying engineering, biology, whatever area they're in. Uh, we're making it a living learning environment because what we know about uh, innovation is it isn't something that happens from eight to five. It could happen at three in the morning, it could happen over a beer. Uh, and so we're encouraging restaurants, hotels, other uh, entities that encourage students and faculty to come together and collide with each other and with businesses to be on the campus. Uh, we've seen a major increase in business interest. We've drawn businesses from as far away as Sweden to our campus and uh, you know we're in the great flyover. We're right in the center of the center uh, and it can be done in that area and it can be done successfully. But uh, we're seeing great interest uh, to a point where tours are getting to be a little bit of a problem because we're giving so many of them. Uh, and uh, we're seeing a excitement both in the local community and in the broader technology uh, industry around us. So your largest employer there, I assume, is Coke Industries. What have they done on campus with you guys? They've done uh, business on our campus uh, in terms of creating a business center. Uh, Annie Koch, who is uh, Koch's daughter-in-law, now is creating a, an experimental school to see if we can take uh, young children and get them engaged in STEM issues and in innovation early. Uh, so uh, they're starting with preschool, actually, uh, and they're building this uh, school right on the campus right near Airbus, right near our engineering building, uh, and we're encouraging those students to be engaged with us uh, from the time they're little children. We think that that's a, a way of getting them excited, getting them interested, and then over time, as we learn, we'll try to generalize this out into public education, uh, but we'll also start encouraging uh, students with disabilities, uh, low-income students also to come in and be part of this experience so that uh, it's a different way of looking at education as well. Let's talk about teach the teachers a little bit. One of my biggest concerns is that this needs to be introduced in grade school, much like we used to teach right. French in, in grade school. What I know Emporia State back home is doing a great job with teaching the teachers. Are any of you have any experience with uh, how we teach in the teachers? Dr. Sands? Um, yes, I'd like to maybe highlight... Um, one of the programs that's funded through the National Science Foundation. Um, we, we run a, uh, a cybersecurity center at, at Moraine Valley, and, and a big part of that cybersecurity center is a faculty uh, development academy. Um, and over the years, um, it's evolved. So first of all, it's a virtual academy. Most computer systems nowadays are accessed remotely, so this academy is actually accessed remotely. And we're able to train faculty from across the country um, at um, free or, or very low rate um, and um, basically, especially in the area of cybersecurity, is that the, the target moves constantly and the content changes constantly. Mm -hmm. So faculty development is a critical part of, uh, of running quality programs. Um, so we've been able to um, train, uh, over, over the um, 10 years that we've run the academy, we've trained over 6,000 faculty members from across the country, and that would include high school faculty, it would include community college, and we've even been had uh, university faculty be part of it. But centralizing those things and having national um, centers like the uh, ATE centers um, enables you know, less to, a better uh, um, investment and in, in be able to reach a larger audience um, without having to have centers all over the place. Okay, Can I get time for one more question? Uh, Dr. Bardo, talk about the, is it Bado, Bido? So paint the picture, what would that look like in the future? If you were king, paint that picture, what Congress, what, what it needs to be, do, be done to update it for us. Uh, well, we have, a, 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 I'm not sure exactly what you're speaking to. The, the, Bi the, the Bay Dole uh, Act you talked oh, about? Oh, the Bay Dole Act. Bay Dole, yeah. forgive um, me. But the, uh, a Birch Bay was a, was a, a well-known congressman many years ago, um, and uh, of course, Senator Dole, uh, we, all, we all know and love. Uh, the the Bayh-Dole Act allowed universities to take inventions and to sell them to the marketplace. Prior to that time, the federal government owned 
anything that the federal government participated in. Mm. This was a sea change for universities that we didn't recognize it. What the Bayh-Dole Act II would do, I mean, it obviously would have a different name, and it might be the Comstock Marshall Act, uh, but the- it Has the, a ring to it. <laughs> but the, uh, the, what the, this would do would be to focus on what does the next generation need to look like? So for example, um, to solve the problems of cybersecurity, to solve problems of health, takes big science and big data. And what's ended up happening is that uh, relatively few universities control basic research, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Don't, don't, I'm not criticizing. But for the rest of us, we can make a real impact by integrating the work we do with the community. And so the Bayh-Dole Act, too, would really focus not on transferring intellectual property to, to business, but would focus on trying to create applied STEM work that would benefit faculty, benefit students, and benefit the economy of the area. And in my long testimony, I did make several suggestions of things that I felt might, might be something to be considered. Okay. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, I now recognize Mr. Lipinski for five minutes. Thank you, uh, I wanna thank the witnesses for their, for their testimony. I wanna start out by uh, asking Dr. Sands about, uh, sort of elaborate on the cybersecurity um, credential, how you would see this coming about, how, do, how does that get, how would that get established in your eyes? Um, you know, we have several national programs out there now that um, really could be leveraged um, to build a national credential. So, you know, as an example, the, the um, NSA DHS Center for Ac Academic Excellence, they've established credentials for institutions. So, you know, as far as aligning curriculum, faculty requirements, um, even institutional requirements. You know, if you're hanging a sign out at your institution at your cybersecurity center, guess what, you've just become a target. So you need to practice what you preach. And um, so part of that program has set those types of standards. And I think it would be an ideal program to expand those types of things to student um, credentials that a student could earn as part of um, their service in a uh, apprenticeship program. And, and a really good example of that might be the, um, the SFS program. So the SFS program, now that the CyberCorp program, it's a scholarship program where students um, uh, basically um, are awarded a, um, a, a, a um, funding for scholarships um, during their, um, their academic time at school, and then they have to pay that back through service to either a federal agency or state or local government. Um, but I think we could actually put standards on that uh, apprenticeship program but that they, and they could earn those um, credentials as part of their service in the uh, apprenticeship program. Um, right now, there really isn't uh, a standard out there for that. And, and the other thing I, I think would be really important is that the SFS program really focuses on federal and, and local um, um, government jobs. I think that should be expanded to the private sector as well, because the private sector is suffering right now with a shortage of cybersecurity workers as well. Now, do you find, uh, is, is it difficult to find students uh, who are equipped to uh, enter the uh, you know, the CyberCorps Scholarship for Service program. Uh, I think there, there there's a challenge. Um, it, in it's a very selective program, um, but I think as more and more community colleges, community colleges are new to the game, so they just came into this program uh, in the last two years, um, and I think community colleges will have a lot in in contributing um, additional um, students into into the program. But I think other programs like Gen Cyber, um, it's a program that's, that's funded through the National Science Foundation also, enables us to run summer camps. So like this summer, we ran a camp, a, a Gen Cyber camp, and we had 50 kids. Um, by the way, half of them were women, which is really unusual in, in this area, or, or, or young girls. Um, and even reached out to organizations like the Girl Scouts. Um, but it allowed kids to come in for a week and learn everything from basic coding, um, capture the flag types of activities in, in cybersecurity, um, and then it wrapped up with a, a short competition. Um, but what it enables us to do is to get the really talented kids that never thought about this type of career or a career in, in the STEM area to see the types of jobs that are out there and then um, the types of skills and, and um, opportunities that are, that are provided in these fields. And I know that you have developed uh 
uh, curricula for uh, uh, grade school, high school. Uh, how do you go about doing that? Do you, and do you see uh, schools being, you know, willing and able to you know, implement these? Um, it was a challenge early on because most schools don't want their students using cybersecurity tools on their production networks. Um, so um, what we found was a model that, again, uses a, a virtual environment. So most schools aren't going to let students even modify credentials on their local machines. Um, but by creating a, a curriculum that's virtual, now you have a safe sandbox where kids can actually learn administration of systems and they can actually uh, um, use systems that take advantage of vulnerabilities and see how those things work. Um, and, and the other thing with that is that we can actually control what we are um, exposing students to. So, um, you know, we want them to see um, the benefit of these tools, but we also want, you know, there to be ethics that's taught as part of the program and so on. Um, but I think, you know, just to address it, one other thing is, you know, exposing students to the actual um, jobs that are out there and bringing them on trips to um, organizations or healthcare facilities or server farms where they can actually see what a typical IT or cybersecurity person um, does and the types of facilities that they work in. Uh, most of us have no idea what those facilities look like. And, and again, most high school teachers have never um, experienced those types of things. Thank you, and I want to thank you for... Uh for your, your work, and I'm um, just proud to have uh, have you and Moraine Valley in uh, there on the uh, southwestern suburb of Chicago. We thank you for your support. Thank you, and I recognize Mr. Banks for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks for holding this important hearing. I'm very pleased to see the Trump administration putting an emphasis on expanding apprenticeships and expanding educational opportunities beyond the traditional four-year college degree, as we've discussed today. There are millions of job openings in our country that require a technical certification short of a college degree. These jobs pay well and can, can support a middle-class lifestyle. And in my home state of Indiana, I was proud to work with then-Governor Mike Pence, uh, who recognized the untapped potential in this area and instituted a number of initiatives to increase access to technical and career education. 58% of Hoosier jobs are classified as middle-skilled, requiring more than a high school diploma, but less than a college degree. At the same time, only 47% of Hoosiers currently qualify as, quote, middle skilled. According to the latest jobs report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there are roughly 6 million job openings in our country. At the same time, the labor force part participation rate among those 25 to 54 is still more than two percentage points below where it was at the beginning of 2008. We need to find a way to connect these workers with good paying jobs that are and will become available, which the data shows are often technical jobs that require certifications. So my first question for you, Dr. Sands, as you direct an advanced technological educational program, do you have protocols in place to enroll those who are currently unemployed to fill middle skill job openings in your area? Can you describe that? Um, yes, we have several different programs. I mean, I could highlight one program. Um, we had a, um, uh, a program last year where we, were, we worked with returning veterans. Um, and basically, it was completely designed around um, short-term um, credentialing. So basically, we had a cohort of 12 veterans. Uh, by the way, 11 finished the program, and uh, 10 found um, employment after completing this program. But, you know, we have to change our traditional programs in many cases to reach those types of students. So they were able to finish this program in a 12-week period. Um, again, work as a cohort. Um, it was almost a perfect program because a lot of these um, students that were veterans already had security clearances, which are really critical in the cybersecurity field. So we were really leveraging, you know, a, na a national resource that was really sort of untapped. Um, and we've run a second um, type of program since then that's, that's also been very, very successful. But I think in many cases what we need are um, programs that are based on stackable credentials, so there are many entrance and exit points, um, and curriculums that are uh, designed around um, the requirements for those industry certifications. Um, so not only are they gaining academic credentials, but they are, you know, like some of the other um, members have, have testified, uh, they're also based around industry certifications and, and the skills and knowledge are required with, with the industries. Great. Thank you. Mr. King, will your task force report on expanding apprenticeships 
uh, includes strategies on connecting prime age workers that have dropped out of the labor force with apprenticeship programs and skilled technical positions? Uh, yes, that is the a, a major goal within uh, expanding apprenticeship is, is not just for you know a feeder system out of schools, but even those, uh, I have a statistic here that shows that um, uh, there are about 5.5 million disconnected people between the ages of 16 and 24 who are currently out of school and not working. And so the key is to, you know, how do we get those individuals involved and teaching them more about the truth and reality of the opportunities and also including industry recognized credentials where you can attain those credentials without having to go through a four year program or even a two year program. And as you earn the credentials, you can then articulate those into college pathways if, if, if your heart desires. So yes, uh, with the industry recognized credentials, it, it makes uh, attaining these jobs much more accessible to, uh, to these individuals that you're speaking of, yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. I yield back. The, the chair recognizes Mrs. Rosen for five minutes. Thank you. I want to thank you all for being here today. And uh, I know Chairwoman uh, Comstock isn't here, but uh, I want to thank her because this week, uh, a bill that I originated, Building Blocks of STEM and Code Like a Girl Act, were actually passed out of this committee and voted on unanimously in the House Tuesday night. And so uh, as a woman who's a former computer programmer, I am especially interested in young girls learning to code. And the Building Blocks of STEM does what you guys are doing, helping teachers in the classroom with curriculum and training and scholarships in education. So uh, I thank the subcommittee for moving that forward and then the whole house and everyone who worked with me on that because we got something done this week in, a, in this space. So I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, community colleges, local businesses, how we create those public-private partnerships. You know, when I'm in Nevada, I ask my local businesses, just like you said, to show kids a pathway to work for them for a good job in their company, whatever that is, whether it's in elementary school, junior high, or high school. and. Um, and to engage with those kids, boys and girls clubs, wherever it makes sense for their business. Because we know, I know, that the fear of data and analytics, it's really that fear, I'm not smart enough to analyze this or see a computer or think about data, is the barrier to success. And um, I had the opportunity to participate in some STEM roundtables with college, uh, kids at the, uh, or students at the College of Southern Nevada and Community College. And um, we know that we're not funded so well there. So I guess I want to ask who, uh, all the panelists, what can we do with, through the, if it's not NSF, maybe through the Department of Education or the Department of Labor, to reach out with our community partners like you're doing in, in a broader way to overcome this fear of data and analytics and show people a pathway to these kinds of jobs. You know, if you watch TV, you think there's about three jobs, police, firemen, right? And so they're not getting exposed to um, some of these really interesting, amazing jobs. So could you speak to some of that? Briefly, I think a couple of things that we have to do is start also at the K through 12 level and start with both parents and counselors. Particularly for the skilled technical workforce, we have to remove the stigma of, about these jobs. That these are actually good paying jobs as well as showing multi ramps or on ramps toward careers. Uh, as one of my colleagues says, it's not just going to four year to school and bust, but also there are a lot of other opportunities in those jobs. So I think one is working with high school counselors, working with parents. I will say that's what I said earlier in some of the Technical organizations have held trials, working with parents, talking with parents who may be, their students may be first uh, generation college, mm -hmm. they're talking to them about these mm -hmm. careers. I think the other thing is uh, building partnerships, and so that's where the National Science Board and NSF can facilitate that conversation between community colleges, technical schools, four-year schools, mm -hmm. and even trade union organizations to right. talk about the opportunities that are there uh, and the ability for people to manage their careers throughout the spectrum. Fantastic. Anyone else want to address it? Thank you. Yeah, Please. Yeah. Um, we are in the process of amalgamating a, a technical college within a research university. Uh, but we also are in the process of restructuring our College of Education to be the primary face 
that works with the technical college mm -hmm. because we really do believe that there's a combination there of working with the teachers, working with the schools, uh, and starting young. But the, the technical college in Kansas has the authority and the funding to work in the schools, which right. we as a research university don't. At the same time, we've got capacity to prepare the teachers for the changes that are coming. I, I think that's where it starts, with the teachers in right. the classroom. Well, we've been very excited because um, one of the projects, um, aircraft are designed uh, throughout the world with a software package called Katia. And with working with Katia, uh, actually with, the, with their parent company, we've been able to get that software into the schools for free. Mm -hmm. And so when a student comes to the university, they've already been programming in the core language that is being used in industry. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. I really appreciate all the work you're doing. It's so important and uh, empowering our teachers to realize that there's pathways for kids to learn these skills uh, in all kinds of great ways is the best way to do it. So thank you. I yield back my time. Great. And I now recognize Mr. Tonko for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and welcome to our guests. I um, would hope, uh, just listening to some discussion, that uh, while we advance this effort for skills-based programs, uh, we need to keep that balance going with higher ed so that we don't abandon one against another. They're both vitally important. So uh, that concern is one that um, I think needs to be addressed head on. Uh, I recently met with leaders at Hudson Valley Community College, HVCC, in uh, my capital district region of New York, an institution that is making a difference uh, on the issue of workforce needs and it, in advanced manufacturing. They shared insights from local business leaders and employers expressing the need to train more people in advanced manufacturing in order to close the skills gap, both in our region and certainly in our country. By 2024, the New York, uh, New York State will have an estimated 168,730 new jobs open in advanced manufacturing and many more, obviously, across the country. With an aging at workforce and rising demand for these skills, we need to be preparing our students, our schools, and our industries now to ensure we have workers ready to enter uh, these emerging fields. HVCC is taking a visionary step uh, forward in this space, creating the Gene F. Haas Center for Advanced Manufacturing Skills, known as CAMS, which will allow the college to double its enrollment in the Advanced Manufacturing Technology, their AOS degree program, and meet the urgent and growing demand for skilled workers in our region. CAMS will be a one-stop hub for employee training and recruitment. The building's design provides corporate partners with access to offices and conference space adjacent to faculty offices, student classrooms, and labs. Facilities will be available for business demonstration purposes, shared training activities, meetings, and events that connect the college to its workforce partners more than ever before. HVCC is also developing innovative programs for student workforce training. For example, their Manufacturing Technology Pathways program allows students to take short, non-credit skills-based uh, skills -based courses leading to local certifications that will help them develop a career ladder of stackable credentials for students that are valued by manufacturers. They also offer an intensive boot camp training providing a, path a pathway to entry into careers in advanced manufacturing or the options of taking credit classes. I've also been told that currently there is more demand by employers for graduates of HVCC's Advanced Manufacturing Technician Program than there are graduates. It's a great thing to know we're training people for career opportunities that exist today. And I've been at the graduations, I've seen the interest, I've seen the passion, and it's a powerful statement made by these young uh, uh, career path uh, bound people. Local companies such as Global Foundries, GE, Water Valley Arsenal, and Simmons Machine Tool Company compete to hire these graduates, and there is still a shortfall. This speaks highly to the program, but also informs uh, us of the urgency of closing this skills gap. So to all panelists, uh, can community colleges fill a vital role in the community uh, of closing skills gaps? Is there a special relationship that they can have with uh, that closes the gap between industry and higher ed? Anyone? Well, you, um, one of the things you pointed up, that the balance between the skilled technical workforce, apprenticeships, and also higher education. If you think about in the STEM fields, 49% of those people who enter the STEM fields come through community colleges. And so community colleges provide those opening doors and a path whether you want to go on for a four-year education or go in for, say, 
uh, a higher uh, technical skilled workforce uh, degree. I think in those areas, that's where the community colleges can really link with the four-year institutions as well as with the trade organizations to be those pathways for those skilled technical workers and to be able to fill those shortages. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Sands? Yeah, I'd like to also speak to this. Um, I think community, community colleges play a special role in that. So um, community colleges can provide a, a second chance. So you know, someone didn't uh, you know, you know, fail the chance to go on to a university, many times come back through the community colleges, get credentials, get in the workforce, and many of those students go on to, to finish undergraduate and graduate degrees. Uh, but we also get returning. Uh, we've had in our, in our program people to return with, with graduate degrees that come back and they uh, are either changing careers or they're trying to upgrade their, their skills. So I think community colleges are well placed to, to provide those types of, um, uh, of, of options. And, you know, you know, when I go to um, different things within my community, I mean, whether it's at a hospital or an auto repair place or whatever, most of the times I ask where they're they're getting their their students, and nine out of ten times, you know, I hear it's it's someone that came through, the, you know, the the neighborhood community college. So I think you know they play a, a vital role in this. Um, part of the thing is in investing so that they have the tools and the technologies that represent the greatest. Um, uh, impact and, and represent what industries actually need because I think that's the biggest challenge we have sometimes is that you know a lot of these things are changing at a rapid pace and community colleges don't always necessarily have the funding to um, represent those types of technologies and the types of skills that are necessary um, to meet changing uh, areas of technology. Yes, Dr. Bardo, were you going to say something? Yes. Dr. Uh, maybe Dr. Mr. King too. Oh, yeah, uh, just very quickly, one of, one of the really big issues that we are seeing is we do so much applied research that we're seeing five and ten years out what the advanced manufacturing is going to look like, uh, and it's going to be very different than it is today. Uh, we're working with major corporations, primarily from the Midwest, but really all over the world, and the, the changes that are coming are dramatic. So it's not just the funding for today, and it's not just getting them into the job today. One of the issues we're seeing in Wichita is people aren't silly. They look and say, well, wait a minute, in five years, we're not gonna be making aircraft the way we're making them today. We're not gonna be designing fuselages the way we're doing it today. So why should I spend all that time preparing when I know that my job's gonna be gone? So having a long-term view where you give people a ladder to success so that it's not just today's job, but if you take if you take today's job, we're going to continue working with you and help you move as advanced manufacturing moves. Thank you. Uh, yes, I think community colleges are extremely important. Um, right now, NEMS, we're working with Raytheon, which is a large uh, missile defense uh, company, uh, with an apprenticeship program that we, we're planning to scale across the entire organization. And, uh, but we're working in Tucson first as a launch. And we're actually, we brought, we're bringing the college and Raytheon together and with NIMS as a consulting piece to work together. So Raytheon and uh, the local college, they're now going all the way, they're planning to go all the way into the middle schools to start giving Raytheon hats. I mean, you're, <laughs> you, you, you know, and the community college will be working with them on the, uh, the recruiting piece. So it, it can't be done by just one piece. It has to be done together, but this, uh, putting skin in the game, the, the, we have Raytheon and the college working together. I think that's key. Thank you. I yield back and I thank the chair for allowing me to go well past, but we had a lot of people anxious to answer, so yeah. thank you, Madam Chair. No, and I, I appreciated the information too, so thank you. And I think I now recognize Mr. Hulkren for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman. I appreciate uh, you all being here. Uh, this is a very important hearing, and it's something that I'm passionate about as member, a member of this committee. Uh, I see sparking an interest in young people in STEM fields as, as a vital part of uh, what we need to be doing and certainly what our nation's uh, needs in order, re our nation needs to remain competitive going into the future. More importantly than that, I, I do think discovery and innovation are part of our DNA as a nation. Back in my district, I've had the privilege of uh, starting a STEM scholars program uh, where I meet with uh, about 30 young people, uh, high schoolers from around my district. I represent seven counties just outside of Chicago. And uh, this is our second year of having our STEM scholars. And I meet with them once a month. I'm going to be with them uh, this Saturday for a couple of hours. We go to different parts around northern Illinois to see how 
uh, they can apply STEM education and STEM passion in careers uh, right in our area. We're so fortunate to have some great laboratories like Fermilab and Argonne, but we have some amazing companies uh, that are doing some really cool work as well. And every place I go, people are looking to hire more engineers, more programmers, so we need to keep uh, figuring out ways to, to spark that. Uh, I asked them if they had any questions for you all. I hope it's all right. I'm going to uh, throw out some questions from my STEM scholars uh, and, and see what your, your thoughts are. One of the scholars, Aiken from Oswego, stressed the importance of hands-on learning and the effects that internships for high school students can have. These are often hard to find and take a company that is willing to host. His school can also give credits uh, for these internships. How can we measure the success of this kind of career exposure at a younger age, and how can we improve the relationship between businesses and schools to develop these opportunities? Uh, I'll give you one example, uh, and this is at the four-year level, um, because there's a concern even at the four-year level that many of our students, even our engineering students, are very good from a book point of view, but they don't know the difference between a Phillips head screwdriver and a regular head screwdriver. I struggle uh, with that too, but... <laughs> Um, one program is we're working with industry is we're working with Northrop Grumman. Uh, Morgan State University is located in the Baltimore, Washington region. Part of that industry is national security. They have a program called Cyber Warriors. And what they have done is they're working with our students. They have them uh, do hands-on coding. They actually do mock attacks on systems. Uh, and so that our students can get that hands-on plus coupled with internships. Uh, you know, when I came along, I won't say how long ago, um, you could come out and not have an internship during the summer. You'd go work for a company, and they'd say you can get up to speed in two years. But most businesses nowadays are out of business in two years if they can't have an employee who hits the ground running. And so also with many of our uh, companies, as well as government partners like the Navy, we work very early on, freshmen coming in and getting internships and getting hands-on experience, coupled with their formal learning, makes a product that comes out the door that, that both industry government wants. That's great. One of my uh, STEM scholars from our first year uh, was a high school student, but was also part of a, a cyber warrior team uh, through his high school uh, where they were doing, like you said, uh, these types of mock attacks, but also learning from it. And I, I talk about it even with my own kids. I've got four kids, but my younger guys, 13 and 16, whenever they travel with me, they're my tech support team. Uh, so whenever I've got a problem or a question with my uh, technology, they're the ones to answer. Let me get through another question quick. Another student, Taylor, who goes to school in Elgin, had some questions about your experiences as being mentors. Uh, how willing are you to take on a mentee, and how many are you able to work with? Have you turned anyone down? Also, how valuable are these experiences to you as a mentor? I would throw it out maybe to one of the uh, other panelists if anybody has a thought on being a mentor. Uh, you know, the, the way we sort of deal with that is that we have a, um, a, a couple different um, groups on campus that specifically serve as right. mentors. So we have women in technology, um, and we basically have about 60 ex-graduates of, of the institution, um, and we pair them up with current students um, for, for mentorship. So it really expands our, our, our capacity. Uh, and we have that in, in, in several other areas. Um, and, and then one of the other things I'd, I'd mention, you, you mentioned the, the national labs. Um, we work with Argonne National Labs, and um, you know they host a, an annual um, skate a competition that students are able to actually get hands-on experience, but they um, have a group of businesses that work with the participants and provide mentorships and, and trips to their uh, their facilities right. and you know so on. Fantastic. The one of the things we learned from the beta test that we completed is that uh, the students are pretty excited about being involved in a real project in a real business. That's right. And what the business told us, actually what the VP in charge of that division told us, was that it gave a new life to many of his long-term employees, that they really felt that having the young person there mm -hmm. changed their perspective as well. And so they had a reverse mentoring day every so often where the student would mentor the older worker as right. well. And so uh, mentoring within a formal organization Actually, our experience has been that has been a tremendous boon, both the organization and to the student. Uh, if I might mention, one of the things that we heard from uh, industry is that if you hire a new engineer with a bachelor's degree, it takes approximately two years for that engineer to contribute to your bottom line. Mm -hmm. 
hmm. which is why you'll hear industry say there are no engineers available. Right. Well, there are, but they're, they're young right. ones, right? right? And so the, uh, what we found is as we put students through the apprenticeship program, that it cut the time to profitability for the business to six months. So it had a huge impact on the bottom line of the business. It had a huge impact on the workers who were working with the students, and it really changed the quality of the students' education. That's fantastic. I'm out of time. I have more questions for my STEM scholars. I may follow up in writing, if that's all right, uh, to get answers to my STEM scholars. One last thing I'll say is that quite a few of my STEM scholars are part of robotics. First Robotics has been amazing. Uh, this idea of gracious professionalism, teaching young people, I think uh, that's something we need to learn here in Congress uh, about uh, the idea of gracious professionalism. But uh, so excited, again, about the mentor relationship that we see through uh, robotics, but so many other things. And uh, it, really encouraging Dr. Bardo to hear about how it is cutting down that time it takes for someone to add real value uh, uh, on the ground. So thank you. Thank you all for your work. Look forward to figuring out how we can work together as well uh, for what we know is the right thing for America. With that, thank you, Chairwoman. I yield back. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Bardo, for that point. That is really interesting. And that really kind of goes to one of the things that we know in the future economy. You have to be lifelong learners. So for the mentors to also be getting that that uh, push from the mentees is, is exciting. Like, and I now yield five minutes to Mr. Beyer. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, very much, and thank you all for being here. Uh, Dr. McCrary, in his recent report on America's skilled technical workforce, the National Academy has recommended the National Science Foundation commission a study on how countries with, quote, more proficient workers had developed their skilled technical workforce. So we all know about the German experience with apprenticeships. I lived in Switzerland for four years, and one of the most interesting pieces was that 70% you know, of their kids were going into the technical vocational training rather than the college-bound. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they had the, 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 uh, the, the Fachhochschule, which is essentially their equivalent <laughs> of the community colleges. And what was fascinating every year was that they, there were more jobs than there were trained workers coming out of these apprenticeship programs or training people for the skills that, that were needed in the workforce. So the, the key question that we asked overseas and which they tried to ask the Department of Labor through the Obama and early Trump administrations was, how do we change the culture here to make that happen? I think how we have to change the culture is first we have to, ch again, as I said earlier, have to change the stigma. We have to say that very early on for a number of folks that there are opportunities besides just the traditional linear four-year track. Um, places like Maryland, places like South Carolina have started very successfully apprentice-based programs. And what they have done is they've gotten into the schools very, very early, talk to people about these different opportunities. I'll give you a good example. In uh, Baltimore City, right now there's about anywhere between 1,500 to maybe 2,000 throughout the state, electrical workers, that need jobs need to be filled. Uh, according to IBEW, about 100,000 across the nation. Uh, but many of these jobs involve coding. Many of these jobs involve understanding circuit analysis. Um, in some sense, the electrician that we knew years ago is not the same today. So what they have done is gone out to the schools and talked about how exciting these jobs can be, how they can put a number of things together. And getting back to what you said about the apprentice-based uh, education, one of the things our task force is going to be looking at is looking at that apprentice-based model and see how that compares with what we can do here. Some of the programs are going on in some of the states now, and how can we adapt parts of that to the economy here in the United States? Thank you very much. Dr. Sands, you have this community college background, which is terrific. Um, you see more and more states, little by little, adopting the free community college model is led first, I guess, by a Republican mayor in Memphis and then by a Republican governor in Tennessee. I think the Republican governor of Maryland is moving in that direction pretty quickly. Is this, by making that 13th and 14th grade free, does this help that? Do we still need to have a, 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 a cash investment in it on behalf of the individual to make the education worthwhile? What's your perspective? I think it's it's more critical than ever. I mean, we look at the cost of universities um, in in uh, colleges across the country, and community colleges, even at the um, the current rates, are, are really the only option that a lot of these students have. So, um, you know, any help that community colleges have in, in lowering tuition, um, especially, I mean, I can just 
mentioned in, in the state of Illinois, with, with our uh, financial issues, um, the, uh, the, the need for more affordable education is more important than ever. Very cool. And Dr. Bardo, you talked about the mismatch in terms of where the apprenticeship programs have grown up. You know, we're, we do great in Connecticut and in Virginia, and maybe not so well in Louisiana and Arkansas. What's the long-term implication of having this disparity? I, th I think the, the fundamental issue is that education changed a lot, and we in higher education have been slow to the table uh, to get to the notion that you have to have experience and apply the knowledge that you learn. To, to know when I was in college, when you were in college, to pass a test, you know, you got an A, you were good. Uh, then it became, okay, well, everybody has to have an internship, some kind of an experience. And what we're finding today is that really un deep understanding of whatever you're studying, if it's English or it's, it's engineering, really requires you to look beyond the classroom. Uh, and I think that not having that happening is really hurting our workforce, it's hurting our national competitiveness, and it's hurting the competitiveness of those states that aren't taking this seriously and moving forward. Great, great, thank you very much. Madam Chair, I yield back. Um, I thank the witnesses for their testimony and the members for their questions, and now the record will remain open for two weeks for additional written comments and written questions from members, um, including some of those that may be from the STEM scholars. I sounded <laughs> very interesting, and I really thank you for the good work you're doing. I think we are really going to be needing and uh, a sea change in how we approach these jobs, and you've really mapped out for us some ideal approaches on how we can um, really change this up uh, for the better. And the great thing about a lot of this is um, we're talking about people who aren't going to have to get hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt for going to college for a degree that may not even be what they wanted. You know, if we really start working with these kids at a young age, have them understand these jobs are available, really have them hands-on experience them and, and, and see the whole career path and opportunities that are available to them, they can both get into areas that will um, you know, pay for themselves as, as well as um, really be what we need in the economy. So I just think there's a lot of exciting synergies here that we've just started to scratch the surface of, but you've really given us a great path here. So I know we're, we were already talking up here on some uh, possible legislation in, in, in this area and how we can continue to support your efforts. So thank you for all you're doing. And we're adjourned. <laughs>